Good evening, and welcome to Good Friday worship here at the United Methodist Church of Red Bank. We hope that you joined us last evening as we entered deeper into this Holy Week journey for Monday Thursday. We're working on getting that video up for you. If you missed it, you can catch up on Facebook. Tonight, we delve into the shadows of Good Friday so that we can emerge into the bright light of Easter morning. We hope you to join us for Easter celebration on Sunday at 10 a.m. But before we get to that celebration tonight, we join in a service of tenebrae, one of darkness and shadows. The candles this evening will be gradually extinguished to symbolize the fading light of the world. And it ends in complete darkness as we mourn Christ's light being snuffed out. During this service, you will be invited to participate at home by extinguishing your own candles. In order to take part fully, you'll need eight candles before you laid out on a table. Choose seven of them to surround your Christ candle. And please, please, please be careful with open flame. <laughs> the service, service begins with all eight candles lit and you may extinguish them one at a time as you see the candles here being extinguished in the chapel. Just as a single flame lit in a dark room seems blinding, it is only when we are submerged in darkness this night that we can fully appreciate and experience the glory and awe of Easter. I invite us now into this worship this evening through the call to worship that is available in the, the bulletin, which you can find by clicking on that link in your comments or following along in the comments. Tonight is a night of darkness. We gather it together like gauze and wrap our souls in it. Tonight is a night of final things. We gather together in the darkness and recall the last breath of our Savior. Tonight is a night of tears. We gather together and pray that the tears can wash away the betrayal yet. Tonight is a night of mourning. We gather together to remember we are not alone, even in the darkness. Let us now sing together the hymn, Ah, Holy Jesus. If you're following along in the bulletin, you will see five verses printed. We'll only be singing verses one, two, and five.
join now together in a centering prayer. O oh God, whose broken heart we perceive on Calvary, in the strength of your compassionate love, give us the courage to acknowledge both our inner pains and the pains of the world, and to surround them all with the transforming power of your love. Amen. That Friday, oh so long ago, why do we call it good? It tells a wretched tale of woe, of thorns and cross of wood. By all his friends left desolate, they could not stand the strain. They left him at the hellish gate of suffering and of pain. That saddest and that darkest day when love was put to death, when evil seemed to have its way to slaughter life and breath. Yet woven in those tragic tales is courage, strength, and grace. He prayed for those who drove the nails. He promised God's embrace. That Friday, oh so long ago, we watch God's love explode. Inspired now, I dare to show my heart is love's abode. We turn now to Psalm 22. I invite you to listen first to a song response, which you would find in our hymn book on Psalter number 752. You will see in the bulletin that music staff printed there. I invite you to listen as Evan sings it for us. And then I will read through the psalm and then invite you to sing along as we sing that response once more together. forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm. I am not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me. For trouble is near. And there is no one to help. Oh,
I saw those soldiers bring that man they called Jesus in to see the high priest. There I was, out by the fire in the courtyard, and I swore I knew who that tall, muscular man across the way was. I'd seen him with the others who'd followed this Jesus. I heard the whisperings from others all around, but I was the only one who was brave enough to speak up. You're one of his disciples, aren't you? I said to him. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know him. He growled at me. I knew that I was right and I wasn't going to let it be. I challenged him again. And again, he told me that he didn't know of this Jesus. Okay, one more try. Are you not one of this man's disciples? I am not. And then a strange silence fell over the area. You could hear a rooster crowing. The man turned ghastly white and ran away. He looked so guilty, like he had let someone down. And I knew it was him. I wonder why he couldn't admit it. First they took him to Ananias, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Ananias sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And there, he spent the night. This is not a good time. This Jesus came, proclaiming a new law, said he was king of the Jews. That's dangerous talk. We have a very tentative peace with the Romans. They let us alone to practice our faith, and we obey their laws. It's uncomfortable and we long for the avenging Messiah, but it isn't this wilderness preacher. He makes me nervous. He's chipping away at what little peace we have. If he destroys this peace, he will destroy God's people. We can't risk it. No matter how the crowds love him, we just can't risk it.
These people are going to drive me crazy. They're in an uproar because of some wilderness preacher. I examined him, asked him pointed, direct questions. His answers puzzled me, but I really could find no reason why he should be brought before me. He did not commit a crime against the Roman government. He was just a thorn in the side of the Jewish religious leaders. They wanted to have him killed. And by their law, they couldn't do it. They wanted me to take care of the matter for them. Scapegoat. I asked if he was king of the Jews, a charge religious people were trying to pin against him so that I would do something. You know, Caesar is our king. Anyway, he said, you say that I am king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Doesn't sound too treasonous to me. I had him flogged, thinking that would placate their bloodlust. The soldiers played a little game with him. They stripped him, flogged him, put an old purple cloak on him, and someone made a crown out of thorn bushes and jammed it on his head. They shouted, Hail to the King of the Jews! and spit at him. Well, they were just having a little jest with him. But I finally had to do something. The crowds were getting out of hand, demanding the extreme punishment, crucifixion. I gave them a choice of who to release. Barabbas, a murderer in our custody, or this flogged and bleeding Jesus. To my surprise, they chose Barabbas. And I had to wash my hands of all that. They made their choice. It was over. But is it? Is it really over? I think not. And I'm going to be reviled just for doing my job. by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. 
So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scriptures say. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that's what the soldiers did. The crowds that had cheered at his entrance to Jerusalem now jeered him as he dragged his heavy cross to the place of crucifixion. It was Golgotha, the skull, a place where the vilest criminals were nailed to a cross and died a slow and agonizing death. My God, it was so horrible. How could they do this to him? He had done nothing wrong. How could God let this happen to this kind healer? My heart was breaking. He had healed me of a host of diseases when all others had given up. He looked at me, smiled, and told me of God's love for me, for me. And I could feel that love, God's love, pouring over me. It was unlike anything I had known before. I left everything and followed Jesus like so many others. The words of compassion, the healing love, the reminders of how God wants us to live. I could listen to Jesus forever. My soul was healed. My spirit was restored. But now, now it was being dragged with him to Golgotha. He stumbled and fell. A strange man was grabbed from the crowd and forced to carry the heavy cross when Jesus could no longer do it. I couldn't break away. I followed, my God, I followed. I stood near his mother and Mary Magdalene and John, and we watched and wept, but no one made us. of Jesus where his mother and some other women he had known well were. He saw his mother then and the disciple John there in front of him. Jesus said, take this son in my place. Take good care of my mother. My son, from the moment the angel said to me, you will bear a son, my life was no longer my own. And yet, it was every bit mine. Moments treasured, remembered, in my heart alone. Every moment that you grew within me, every day of his youth, every movement of his ministry from the day at Cana to this very minute. At times the pain of watching him give his life away seemed harder to bear than the wonder of this unimaginable life God had given me. And especially now, in this moment, I am not just the mother of Jesus shedding tears for my son. I am the tears of any parent who has seen their child die before them. 
I am the tears of every parent who has lost children in war and injustice. I am the tears of all loved ones who cannot save their loved ones as they starve or they're taken from them in illness or injury or they're swept away by a tsunami or a flood. I know the tears of the parents whose children lose their lives to addiction or are consumed by depression or who are lost to violence. And I am the tears of those who do not know the fate of their missing ones. I am the tears.
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Woman, here is your son, here is your mother. I am thirsty. It is finished. God, into your hands I commend my spirit. Oh.